please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer. We thank you so much for yet another day of life. We thank you for watching over this congregation. We especially thank you, Heavenly Father, for your plan of salvation, the fact that you were willing to send your son and have him be sacrificed on a cross in a most painful and cruel death. And you did this out of love for your creation for us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for suffering such pain on our behalf. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you be with the folks here that are sick and ailing and so much flu and, and pneumonia and we're having different problems. And We ask, Lord, that your hand be on all these folks and help guide the hands of those administering to those folks and restore them and help them as your will dictates. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you help us to always teach and preach here in absolute truth. Help us to not deviate from your word not to add to it nor take away. We pray, Heavenly Father, you be with the men that stand before us. Give them long and useful lives in your service. And we ask that you be with the folks that, that teach the classrooms and the young ones and help them to always teach and preach in your, in your absolute truth. We pray, Heavenly Father, as we continue here, these songs are pleasing to you, the prayers that all these that you will accept. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that we continue to grow in number and in spirit. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Be turning your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2. Let's take a look for a minute at uh, a chronology where we are in the Old Testament. 
<clears throat> we're studying right now from the book of Isaiah. And Isaiah lived, he was a prophet, from about 740 to 690 B.C. If you go back and take a look at the stories that we have studied, where we had King Saul, David, and Solomon. So King David was a king for 40 years, and he ruled from 1020 to 980. A good memory jogger is... His 40 years exactly split 1,000 years before Christ. Solomon ended his uh, reign at 940. The two men that we have studied the last couple of times, Elisha and Elijah, are right between these. They live from about somewhere around 860 to around 800 years before Christ. And I want to talk a little bit about that. In this period of time, especially in the northern kingdom... There was no spiritual guidance at all coming from the kings. When you think about the kings of this time, the northern kingdom, every one of those kings were considered evil by God. They started with Jeroboam. Not a single one of them provided. Most of them didn't even believe in Jehovah God. And so there was absolutely no spiritual guidance coming from the kings of the nations at this time. If you go back and take a look and think as an example in the time of King David... Samuel was the, uh, was the prophet in the time of King Saul and early into the time of King David. Then we had Nathan the prophet. Nathan was the one that came to David and said, you're the man. You remember the story of Bathsheba. Later in David's life, there was a prophet named Gad. He was the one that was responsible for telling, telling David, you sinned when he numbered the troops. If you were to study these three prophets and many others, you see virtually no ability to perform miracles at all. Now, there, I say that. I mean, there are small things. But these three prophets and a dozen others that I could put up here had almost no ability to perform miracles. The two men, Elijah and Elisha, had incredible ability to perform one miracle after another after another. The man, Elisha, that we're going to study tonight, I would say to you, if you simply looked at the number of miracles that we're told in the Bible that he performed, it would have been double or triple that of Elijah. So I want you to think with me as we go through a story, spend just a moment on a story that we took a look at uh, several weeks ago. In 1 Kings chapter 19, I'm going to go back a little bit. This was a time when... Elijah had been hiding in a cave and God had come to him several times and he said to him it's time for you to get out of that cave oh he said you don't know how hard I've worked and I'm the only one that loves you and you remember the primary thing he said was you get out of that cave and you go down in that valley there's 7,000 people down there that have not uh, need uh, bowed their knee to Baal you find them the verse right before that said to Elijah, your next job is to anoint the next king and to anoint the next prophet. That's what second, uh, 1 Samuel uh, chapter 19 and verse 16. Elijah was an old man at this time and he was told by God, you don't have much longer to be on this earth. And so Elisha was appointed a king, appointed a prophet rather, all the way back in 1 Kings. So just keep that in mind. When you take a look at 2 Kings, <clears throat> you study this story, and we did in some detail. For reasons that I, I don't know, we were not told, Elijah absolutely wanted to be alone. He had been told by God that God was going to take him off this earth, that he would not see death. He didn't know what that was going to look like. He didn't know exactly what it was going to entail but he wanted to be alone. That's why several times he said to Elisha, you stay here and I'm going to go over here. No, I'm going with you. I'm going with you. Almost like a child would. Three different times in the text, Elisha made certain he wanted to be with, with Elijah. The, la the third time, Elisha asked Elijah for something. And I want you to look with me, beginning in verse verse. Uh, <clears throat> six chapter uh, the second kings two and six 
Elijah said to him, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. This is the third time he would say this. And he said, As the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave. I'm, I'm going with you. So the two men went on, and fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood opposite them at a distance while the two of them stood by the Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and folded it together and struck the water, and they were divided there, and so that, that the two of them crossed over on dry land. Verse 9 says, It came about when they had crossed the Jordan that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask whatever you shall do before me, and I, before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. I used this phrase this morning. I spent a few minutes on it for you to understand. The idea of double portion was very common uh, throughout the Old Testament. <clears throat> it really had to do with favored status, and that is the oldest male child... I don't care if you had two children. I don't care if you had 22 children. The oldest male child would receive double the amount of every other person. The reason for that was it, he would be the head of the household. He also would receive a blessing. And so what happens is he's responsible for all of the younger children. He's responsible for any widows that may have come from men, who, uh, his brothers that died. And so he had a, a sizable job. So the double portion was a, a pretty standard part of the Old Testament. Now, Elisha was no kin to Elijah, but he's asking him, I want double, I want favored status. I want to be considered favored amongst the, the, the prophets. Now, there was a school, if you will, a place where prophets were training, and there were 50 of them close to this area. So Elisha said, I want favored status. I want the, the, these prophets to know that I'm the primary guy. I'm the main guy. That's what the double portion is about. <clears throat> People, many, many, many stories have written, been written that says, was he asking for twice the miraculous power? That may well have come with it, but that was not the original intent. Now look at this for just a minute. <clears throat> and so that's what he asked. In verse 10, what you see here is, uh, he says, you've asked a hard thing. Probably hard because he didn't have the ability to give that. You've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me, when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. I feel quite certain that Elijah did not have the ability to grant this wish. And so when Elisha asked it, he says, all I'm going to tell you is, when I'm taken off the earth, whatever it looks like, if you're able to see me, then you're going to receive this favored status. In verse 11, it came about as they were going on and talking that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire which separated the two of them. So here was a case where Elisha had worked very hard. Wherever you go, I go. No, I'm not staying here. I'm going with you. I'm staying with you no matter where you go. But all of a sudden... There was something that appeared to be chariots of fire and horses that separated the two of them. It's going to be interesting because in just a little while you're going to see these chariots of horses used again in the story of Elisha. And Elijah, the latter part of verse 11, went up in a whirlwind. And Elisha saw it. So you remember what was the story we just talked about. And he cried, My father! My father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen. And he said no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into pieces. That's how they showed the frustration or sadness back in that day. He also took the mantle that Elijah, of Elijah that fell from him and returned and stood by the bank of the Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and struck the water and said, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he also had struck the water, they were divided here and now, and Elisha crossed it. Now, at this time, there are 50 younger prophets on the other side of the river. So I want you to think about, they were over with these prophets. Elijah takes his coat off. He lays it on the water, and the waters of the Jordan River parted, and they walked across to the other side. So just on the other side of the river, there are now 50 prophets watching <coughs> all of this. <coughs> And they saw Elijah go up into the sky as well. 
So Elisha's first concern is, have I been given the power? Have I been given the leadership? So the mantle's now laying on the ground. So he takes the mantle and he walks over to the Jordan River and he lays the mantle on, uh, on the water. And what happens? It looked exactly the same as it did when Elijah did it. And all the prophets saw that. Now, that was the indication. That was the marker that Elisha had received this double portion of power that he had asked for. Elijah didn't have the ability to give it, but he says, you're asking a hard thing because you're above my pay grade. I want to talk a little bit about the, the right happened, what happened after that story because there's an interesting thing I want you to look at. Verse 15. <clears throat> when the sons of the prophets uh, who were at Jericho opposite uh, had seen, uh, uh, opposite him saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. He had received that, that favored status, or he was received the double portion. And they said to him, behold now, there were with you servants, 50 strong men. Let them go and search for your master. Now isn't that interesting? They didn't know what happened to him, and they didn't know, was he carried just a mile away? Was he carried up in the mountains, or was he carried to heaven? And so they're saying, we saw it. Let us go search for him. And Elisha says to him, you don't need to worry about that. But look a little bit further. <clears throat> Please let us go and search for the master. Perhaps the Spirit of the Lord has taken him up and cast him on some mountain or in some valley. And he said, you shall not sin, meaning... You're wasting your time. But when they urged him until he was ashamed, he was tired of saying, let it go, leave it alone. He said, sent. And they sent therefore 50 men and searched three days, but did not find him. And they returned to him while he was staying in Jericho and said to him, did I not say to you, do not go. Elisha knew that he was not on the earth any longer, that he had been taken up. <clears throat> when I think about this, I want you to think about a parallel for a moment. Who was the other man who, who was taken up to heaven and never saw death? Who, what, what was his name? Enoch, okay. Genesis chapter 5. He was and he was not because God took him. That's what Genesis chapter 5 said. I wonder if anyone saw him taken off the earth. If, if, yes or no, and we're not told that, I'm just speculating, I wonder if his people looked for him. Was there a period of time that they didn't know what happened to him and they looked for some long period of time? Exactly how did that happen? But in this case, Elisha knew. He was not carried up to some mountain. He wasn't carried down to a valley someplace. And he said to the prophets, you can just look all you want to look, but I'm going to tell you, you're not going to find Elijah. He had been carried into heaven. Elisha, uh, Elisha explained that to them. There's an interesting little story that comes up <clears throat> after this, and I want to just make a point. As I've, in my studying the Bible, and perhaps yours too, there are so many things that I wish I knew a whole lot more about. There are so many things that I wish that we had been given just a little more information on these stories, but we weren't. So I believe that whatever story we're given has value. Now take a look at a, a strange little story that happened. In verse 23, now this is very shortly after, I'm going to tell you, very shortly after Elisha now receives the double portion He's, he has the mantle of Elijah. The prophets know that he is the, the favored prophet. A strange little story happens, and I want you to read with me for a moment, beginning in verse 23. Then he went up from there to Bethel, and he was going up that way. Young lads came out from the city and mocked him and said to him, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. Now imagine him going along the road, and you've got a bunch of teenage boys here just, <clears throat> just making fun and picking at this, uh, this old man who I'm assuming was bald. That would have happened in any kind of situation in the world. You've probably all seen it a thousand times. Verse 24, when he looked behind him and saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. Then two female bears came out of the woods and tore up 
42 lads of their numbers. And when he went from there to Mount Carmel and from there to Samaria, this is the first miracle that I believe involves this double portion, but isn't that a strange thing? Instead of him just saying, I'll oh, forget about it, don't worry about it. He turned around, cursed these boys, and there were two female bears came and just tore to pieces 42 young men. <clears throat> now I want you to think about something for a minute. How many of you believe, uh, especially those of you that are my age and older, how many of you believe that you were disciplined much more harshly in your younger days growing up than most young people today? Anybody disagree with that? Has it changed the nation that we live in? I think it's part of the, the culture that we currently have. Do you think this story spread far and wide throughout the countryside? <clears throat> lots of mamas and daddies and lots of teenage boys. So they made the decision that if there is somebody of prominence and respect, you better watch your mouth. Now, he could have, uh, he could have just, you know, kind of said something ugly to him. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. I'm going to go tell your mom and daddy. But this was, this was pretty prominent, wasn't it? It was pretty significant. I'm going to say to you that that was a story, even though it's a tiny little story, and you think, with the limited information that we have about Elisha, why was that put in there? But I'm going to tell you it was pretty significant, I have no doubt, to the people of that time. In 2 Kings chapter 4, there is a woman here, very much like Elisha. So God always made certain that the prophets had a place to live. They had no money. They didn't have any means of making money. God didn't pay them a salary. So very much like the apostles in the New Testament, you just go out and whoever will, will give you shelter for a while, you stay with them and um, you give them your peace. And if they don't want you to stay anymore, you leave. <clears throat> so God always made made. Uh, preparations for these prophets to have someone to stay. Very much like Elijah, Elisha stayed with a widow woman for a long time. And she had been so good to him, God said you, to Elisha, you pay her back. You give her a blessing. And what he gave her was the ability to have a child when she was quite old. And I want you to look with me for just a moment. Beginning in verse 12, chapter 4. Uh, in verse, you can take a look in verse 8. Chapter 4 and verse 8. There came a day when Elisha passed over to Shuham, where there was a prominent woman, and she persuaded him to eat food. And also, she often, uh, as often as he passed by, he turned there to eat food. <clears throat> she said to her husband, Behold, I perceive this is a holy man of God passing by continually. Please let us make a walled-up chamber, and let us set a bed for him, and there a table uh, and a chair. And a lampstand. I think I said widow woman. I didn't mean to say that. I meant to say she didn't have children. Now in verse um, 12, uh, let's look at the verse 13 and 14. You can see there, he asked a question. You have been so kind to me. You've been so good to me. What can I do for you? And she didn't really know the answer to that. So in verse 16, he says, at this season next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, No, my Lord, O man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. And the woman conceived and bore a son at that season the next year, as Elisha had said to her. And when the child grew up, the day came that he went out to work with his father with the reapers. And he said to his father, My head, my head. And he said to, and he said to his servant, Carry me to his mother. And when they had taken him, she brought him to his mother, and he sat on her lap until noon and then died. Now, just let that soak in for a minute. Here's a woman who had no child. Uh, she didn't ask for a child, but Elijah said, I'm going to give you a child. And a year from now, when I come back, you're going to have a child. So she has the child, lives for some amount of time. He's old enough to go out and work in the fields with his father and other people. He has some sort of issue with his head, and by the time he gets back to his mother, he's dead. I want you to look at how she responds to this tragedy. She had no clue what was going to happen, just like you and I don't, don't know what's going to happen in our lives when we decide to do the right thing. So in uh, verse 24, they saddled the donkey, and they went and went after Elisha. He's the only guy that can possibly fix this if it can be fixed. 
So you can see that in verse uh, 24, 25, and 26. Verse 26, please run to meet him and say, it is well, is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with your child? And she said, it's well. When she said that, the child was laying dead on his bed. So Elijah asked the question, how are you doing? I'm doing okay. How's your husband doing? He's doing okay. Well, how about your son? Oh, he, he's well. He's fine. Look a little bit further. Verse 27. When she came to the man of God to the hill, she caught hold of his feet. And Gehazi, who came up and pushed her away, but the man of God said, let her alone. For her soul is troubled within her. He could certainly tell that there was something major happening. And she was wanting to get in to see Elijah and get around all the people that were his handlers. <clears throat> in verse 28, she said, did I ask for a son from my Lord? Did I not say, do not deceive me? He, she never asked for a child, but the child was given. She had him for a while. Now the child died. And he said to Gehazi, Gird up your loins and take my staff in your hand and go your way. And if you meet any man, do not salute him. Don't you be in a hurry. You don't let anything slow you down. And if anyone salutes you, do not answer him and lay my staff on the lad's face. Verse 31, Gehazi passed on from there and laid his staff on the lad's face, but there was neither sound nor response. So he returned to meet him and told him, and the lad had not awakened. So his staff didn't accomplish the, what needed to be done. In verse 34, he went up and lay on the child and put his mouth on his mouth and his eyes on his eyes and his hands on his hands, and he stretched himself on him, and the flesh of the child became warm. Then he returned and walked in the house once back and forth and went up and stretched on him, and the lad sneezed seven times, and the lad opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite. So he called her, and when she came to him, he said, Take up your son. Now, I want you to think about, I want you to keep this story in mind because I want to come back to it in a minute. <clears throat> when Elisha laid on top of this boy, and he put his face to face, eyes to eyes, nose to nose, mouth to mouth, he laid on the boy, and the boy sneezed seven times, and then he got warm and he stood up. Let that story stick in your mind because I'm going to come back to it in just a moment. Chapter... Um, Chapter 5, <coughs> pardon me, chapter 5 is a story that you're familiar with. I do a lesson on the story of Naaman, and I call it Three Angry Men. Probably haven't done it here, but I've done it a number of times over the years. In this story, there are three men that get extremely angry over very different things, and it's kind of a subset of the story. But I want you to look with me in chapter 5 now. Chapter 5, Naaman, captain of the armies of Syria, was a great man with his master and highly respected. And because of him, the Lord had given victory to Syria. This man was a valiant warrior, but he was a leper. And you know all that goes with that. So he had a young lady who was a, an Israelite girl, <clears throat> and she loved this master because he was a good man. He was a godly man. And she said, I want to help you. I know a man in Israel who's a prophet of God that I know he can heal your leprosy. And he didn't believe it for a long period of time. But in verse 5, the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. And he departed and took him ten talents of silver and six thousand shekels of gold and ten changes of clothes. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, And now this letter comes to you. Behold, I have sent Naaman my servant to you that you may cure him of his leprosy. <clears throat> and when it came about, the king of Israel read this letter. He tore his clothes and he said, Am I God to kill and make alive? This man is sending word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? By considering now and see all that he has quarreled against me. Now, I want to just stop for a minute and tell you what's happening. This man of Israel, this Israelite king, didn't know God. And he sure didn't know who Elisha was. And he had no clue that there was a man living in his kingdom that had this incredible power. So when he received this letter from the king of Assyria, or us of Syria, he says, what is he doing? 
Does he think I'm God? He's got a man that's got leprosy, and he's telling me he's going to send him over here so we can cure him of leprosy. Is he crazy? We don't have any ability to do that. This king didn't have the foggiest clue who Elisha was because <clears throat> he had no interest in God or the people of God. And verse 8, it happened when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes that he sent word to the king saying, why have you torn your clothes? Now let, me come, let him come to me and there shall, he shall know there's a prophet in Israel. The king will know it. The king of Syria will know it, and Naaman will know that there is a true prophet of the king of, of God here. So this first man, the first man that got angry was the king of Israel because he was a godless man, and he didn't have a clue that there was a prophet that had this kind of incredible power by the name of Elisha. He had no clue who Elisha was. <clears throat> Let me tell you something interesting. Nebuchadnezzar the latter part of his life, knew who Daniel was very well. Daniel had interpreted dreams for Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel had helped Nebuchadnezzar. But when Nebuchadnezzar died, Daniel was likely in prison. So Nebuchadnezzar's son had no clue who Daniel was. When the time came that the hand came out and wrote on the wall, and people were just speechless. They were dumbfounded in this great feast that Belshazzar has. He's told, there's an old man that helped your daddy with this, and we need to get hold of him. Now, what I would tell you is, you just think about, if a king is godly, let's take Hezekiah. Hezekiah was very close to Elijah. They were close friends. They were together. He was in and out of Hezekiah's house. It was Elijah that came to him and said, in his house, you need to get your business together. It was Elijah that came back to Hezekiah and said, the Lord has granted you 15 years. But for these men who were godless, they didn't believe in Jehovah God, they certainly wouldn't have believed in the prophets of God. And so he was so angry, and he was angry over nothing because he was angry because of his own ignorance. Now look a little bit further. <clears throat> in verse 9, Naaman came with horses and chariots and stood at the doorway of the house of Elisha. You can imagine, he's a prominent military guy. He has this huge entourage showing up at the little house where Elijah lived. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan River seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. And I want you to stop for a minute because you're about to see the second angry person. So he comes up. He's got all kinds of goodies to give Elisha. He's got all kinds of things. He pulls his huge entourage up. You can imagine the president with 10 or 15 uh, black suburbans here in this big entourage. And Elisha doesn't even come out. He doesn't even come out to shake hands with the guy. He sends a messenger to him saying, just go tell him. Go tell him, wash in the Jordan River seven times, everything will be fine. How do you think this prominent uh, man, this prominent military man handled that? <clears throat> he was snubbed as far as he was concerned. So in verse 11, Naaman was furious. And he went away and said, behold, I thought. Well, that was part of the problem. Naaman didn't have a clue who God was, Jehovah God. He didn't, he didn't know what to expect. But he, he was expecting more. He had been dissed. So he says in verse 11, Behold, Naaman was furious and went away and said, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over me and cure the leprosy. He begins talking about the beautiful rivers that he has. We got a whole lot better rivers back at our place. Why would I come all the way over here and, and, and dip several times in this old nasty river? It just doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> How many times in your life have you read something that God wants you to do? Or someone who has, who has good Bible knowledge says to you, this is what you need to fix in your life. This is what you need to change. And you feel snubbed. You feel dissed. He shouldn't have talked to me that way. He should know that I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm doing. I know how to raise my kids. I know how to be married. I know how to do all these kinds of things. And so we feel dissed. What, what causes that? Somebody just tell me. 
So now Naaman is furious, and he's furious because he did not get the welcome that he thought he was going to get. What do you think causes that? Pride. Absolutely. Pride. Pride. He was expecting more. Look a little bit further now. In verse 13, verse uh, 12, the latter part, he turned away in a rage. Then his servant came to him and spoke to him and said, My father, had not the prophet told you some great thing, would you have done it? If you had to t uh, climb the top of a mountain, if you had to uh, move uh, uh, you know, 10,000 pounds of dirt, would you have done that? So, in the latter part of verse 13, how much more then when he says, wash and be clean? That was it. That was pretty simple. So he went down and dipped himself, verse 14, seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God with all his company and came and stood before and behold now I know there is no God on earth but in Israel so please take a present from your servant. That's exactly what Jehovah God was trying to do. The king didn't know, the king of Syria nor the king of Israel knew who Elisha was, but Naaman did. Now he wants to give a reward. Do you think this man of God is going to take his reward? What would you guess? No. You talk about taking a vow of poverty, but Naaman had a very close associate. His name was Gehazi, is how I pronounce it. And Gehazi sees something here that he likes. This is a money-making operation. Man, oh man, if I can get Elisha to do this a few times, we can get wealthy off of this. So Elisha said, I don't need your money. I don't need any of your stuff. You can just take it all back with you. So as he's headed out, his servant Gehazi said, I got a plan. Ah, I got a plan. So he jumps up. Uh, <coughs> He jumps ahead and he runs up there and he's going to have a conversation. Now, hey, man, 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 man we, we, we might have been a little bit hasty. We might have been a little bit hasty on saying, don't give us anything. And so we, we've reconsidered. Me and uh, uh, Elisha have reconsidered here. <clears throat> so in verse 20, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, thought, Behold, my master has spared this Naaman, this Syrian, by not, uh, by not receiving from his hand what he brought. As the Lord lives, I'll run after him and take something from him. So Gehazi pursued Naaman. When Naaman saw him running as well, he sat down. He came down from the chariot to meet him and said, "Is all well? I mean, what are you what are you running after me for?" And he said, "All is well. My master has sent me, saying, Behold, just now two young men of the sons of the prophets have come to me." From the hill country of Ephraim, please give them a talent of silver and two changes of clothing. Was that a lie? It was what my daddy used to call a bald face lie. He didn't, he didn't just kind of alter the tr truth. This was a flat-out bald face lie. That this longtime assistant of Elisha has just told, but it's not the last one. <clears throat> Verse 23, and Naaman said, well, please take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver and two bags with a change of clothes and gave them to and to the servants and they carried them before him. And when he came to the hill, he took them from the hand and deposited them in the house and he sent the men away and they departed. He didn't want, he certainly did not want Elisha to know what he had done. In verse 20, uh, 25, he went in and stood before his master and Elisha said to him, where have you been, Gehazi? How many of you, when you were young, did you do something wrong, and when you came in the house, the first thing your mama or daddy asked you was, where have you been? Anybody ever had that happen to them before? Where, where have you been? Well, what have you been up to? Oh, nothing. I, I've been, I haven't been up to anything. Do parents normally see right through that? What do you think about this prophet of God? Do you think he saw through that lie? Let's look here. Where have you been, Gehazi? Verse 25 said, and he said, your servant went nowhere. Isn't that amazing? That's a story that every kid tells. Where have you been? I haven't been anywhere. I haven't gone anywhere. Wait a minute. 
I'm, I'm pretty sure you, oh, no, 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 not me. You must be mistaken. That's somebody else. That wasn't me. <clears throat> In verse 26, he said to this servant, Did not my heart go with you when the man turned his chariot to meet you? Is it time to receive money and receive clothing and olives, uh, olive yards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and male and female servants? Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman. What was going to happen to that leprosy? <coughs> so the, the third lie, or the third person who got angry, we have first the king of Israel, thinking that the king of Syria was trying to pick a fight with him when he says, hey, I'm going to send a person who is very close to me named Naaman. I'm going to send him to you so you can cure him of his leprosy. And the king of, uh, of Israel says, are you crazy? You think I'm God? You trying to pick a fight with me? The second person was Naaman, <clears throat> who got very angry. He got furious, and he left in a rage because he had been dissed, because he hadn't been treated like he thought he ought to be treated. And the third person that gets angry in the story is the person who's the servant of Naaman, because the servant, rather, of Elisha, because he saw an opportunity for money, and he watched that opportunity just sailing away, and he said, i got to fix this. But in verse 27, therefore the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. So he went away from his presence a leper as white as snow. Was that a pretty severe punishment? He didn't say, you're going to become a leper. Like he did with Miriam and Aaron, if you remember that story when when they were saying to, to Moses or saying to God, you're not giving us the <clears throat> all the recognition that our little brother Moses is getting and we're not happy about it. Well, they were only leprous for a short period of time and they were healed. How long did Naaman have this leprosy? Forever. But not only that, who got it after him? This leprosy shall cling to you and your descendants or your seed forever. Is it fair that when a man or a woman does something wrong, that their seed is punished for long, long periods of time? Does that seem fair to you? But yet it happened in the case of God all the time. A man makes a mistake or he does something that's sinful in God's eyes and it's significantly sinful. And because of that, multiple generations. I said to you, if you read every single time, I'm going to just give you one example. Turn back to Exodus chapter 20. Every single time the Ten Commandments are listed, there is something that's very important I want you to look at. Pardon me, Exodus chapter 20. And I will say to you, if you study the several places in the, in the Pentateuch where the Ten Commandments are, are listed, they always carry this same thing. And I want you to look at it with me for a moment. Exodus 20 chapter 5, he says, You shall not worship or serve these foreign idols, for I, the Lord, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generation of all those who hate me. This was something that if the sin was egregious enough, God imparted that sin to my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren up to multiple generations. So when we think about this, it seems severe, but it was how the Lord saw fit to do it. He believed that what Gehazi had done was, was something that was intolerable. There, another very quick little story, and then I want to finish up my lesson. Our time is up. In the sixth chapter, there's another interesting little story. I'm, I'm going to tell you, if you take a look at chapters 2 through, <coughs> two through four, uh, 13, there are many, many more miracles. There are a few of them that are as odd to me. There were men who were chopping wood. They had one axe, 
and they were chopping this wood by, by a, a body of water here, and the, the handle, the, the head of the axe flew off and went in the water. And they were so distraught. What, this only axe we got, what are we going to do? Anybody know what happened in this story? So Elisha takes a, takes a little twig, and he goes down and starts tapping the water, tapping the water, tapping the water, and that iron just raised up. And they just picked it up and put it back on the axe. Now, isn't that interesting that that's just a story that is told? But I want to finish up taking a look. That in chapter 6, there is a fabulous story. I don't have time to tell it. <clears throat> the armies are surrounding Elisha and other people. The horses coming in, and they see something. And I want to just show you for a second in chapter 6. Elisha said, the people that are for us are much larger than the people that are coming against us. Trust me. And all of a sudden, God made something appear to the horses and to the people of a pursuing army. And take a look um, in chapter 6, uh, in verse 13. <clears throat> and go see, he said, that I may send to take him. And he was told, behold, he is in Dothan. They're looking now for Elisha because... They're wanting to take him in and put him to death or imprison him. And they sent, verse 14, horses and chariots and a great army and came up by night and surrounded the city. Now the attendant of the man of God had risen early and gone before an army of horses and chariots was circling. He's telling him, it's not looking good out here. Things are looking rough. In verse 7, uh, verse 16, there is a beautiful passage. Look at this passage in verse 16. He answered, to his servant, do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Isn't that the message that we see throughout the entire New Testament? How much power does the devil have over our lives? He has exactly what you give him, and not an ounce more. So in verse 17, Elijah prayed. And said, O oh Lord, I pray, open their eyes that they may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the servant's eyes. And he saw, and behold, the mountains were full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And when they struck down, and when they uh, came down to him, Elisha prayed. And the Lord said, Strike this people with blindness, I pray. So he struck them with blindness according to the word. Of Elisha. And Elisha said to them, This is not the way into the city. Follow me, and I will bring you this, this, this man to seek you. And he brought him to Samaria. There's a lot more to that story. But I want you to turn with me to chapter 14. Chapter 14. <clears throat> Let's go back to the Shunammite woman who Elisha had given her a child, and the child was up old enough that he could work in the field. And old enough to where uh, he was out away from his mother, and he dies. And somebody tell me, how did Elisha resurrect this child? First off, was his staff alone powerful enough to do it? No. So how did Elisha resurrect this child? He laid on him. Hand to hand, face to face, eye to eye, nose to nose, mouth to mouth. And he was there for just a moment, and the child revived. I want to show you an interesting story in chapter 14 and verse 20. 14 and 20. I really believe it has to do with this, the double portion that he was promised. <clears throat> chapter, uh, chapter, I'm sorry, it's 13 and 20. 13 and 20. Elisha died, and they buried him, verse 20 said. Now the bands of the Moabites would invade the land in the spring of the year. And as they were burying a man, so you can imagine Elisha has been buried now in a grave. And there's another man that has died, and they're getting ready to bury him. And they see this marauding band of Moabites who came and just scorched earth, took everything that they wanted. As they were burying this man, behold, they saw a marauding band, and they cast the man into the grave of Elisha. 
And when the man touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet. Is that an interesting story? Elisha was dead. But his body had enough power that they decided they needed to get rid of this man, and so they put him, and you think about, we think about here digging a hole. In this case, almost always, this would have been some place they carved in rock <clears throat> in this part of the country. And so they needed to get rid of this body. They were afraid that these, uh, that these Moabites would come. And so they just carried this man, and they pitched him into the grave of Elijah. And when this dead man's body touched the dead body of Elisha, what happened? He stood up. That's a pretty good indication of the power of this man, wasn't it? Do you see anything like that anywhere else in the Bible, that a man who, after he was dead, he had that kind of power that he could raise someone from the dead after his death? There are many, many more stories. I, I went through about a few of them, but there's probably a dozen more stories between chapter 2 and chapter 13. Elijah passed away, and he will be replaced, and that will be our story for next week. Thank you for listening to me. We've got a song this evening that Brother Byron's going to lead for us. That'll be our song of encouragement for the evening. If anyone needs to respond in any way, let it be known and, as we stand and sing.
Let's pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your son, Jesus. As we take this bread, we remember the suffering Christ did for our salvation. As we take this bread, let us make a commitment to follow in his footsteps and his ordinance. And as we take this bread, we do this in remember of Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. Anyone? Let us pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your Son, Jesus, who shed his blood for our transgressions against you. And thank you, Father, for keeping us strong and keeping us as a family. And as we do this, that we strive to live right in your name. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This part of the service for those who would like to make a contribution. Let us pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you for this day. And thank you for the work that this provides for this church and this community. We're able to come worship in this building. And we're able to unite as one and be in one accord. Thank you for the many gifts that you give us provide for ourselves and our families and continue to bless us so we can be a blessing to others. In Christ Jesus' name, amen.
Is there any announcements or comments? Sunday in January be at 5.30 p.m. And we also like to thank our visitors and our honored guests and we would love for you to return to worship and praise with us. And there's no more comments. We'll be dismissed with closing prayer. Shall we pray? Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Father, once again, we come before you thanking you for this beautiful Lord's Day. Thank you for the opportunity we've had to meet together today to study thy word, to hear lessons from thy word, to be with our fellow Christians. Father, we ask that you be with the three families that have lost loved ones recently. Let be with each of us as we pray for them. Give them comfort, Father. We ask that you be with our congregation here. Let us continue to grow in thy word and be with us in all that we do. We know many times we fall short, Father. We make mistakes. Forgive us of our sins. Guide us through all of our life. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.